I'm sitting here with Mike Score of A Flock of Seagulls, and he's offered to answer some questions for some of these crazy fans out there before we get started with this concert. So let's get started with a question from Jim Jelvig. Jim says, going back to when Iran became the most played video on MTV, did you know at that point how big in America you were going to be? Uh, no, but the record company kept telling us that we were doing, you know, big stuff. And to us, it was just like, does it get us more gigs? And uh, it wasn't actually until it hit maybe the top 20 that we kind of started to go, wow, you know, we're the top 20 in America. And then suddenly like top 15, you know, and then I think... I think it got up to eight or nine eventually, but to us that was like way beyond anything we'd ever thought of. So, but to me personally, it, it wasn't our best song. And I thought, well, if Iran can get that high, then others should get even higher. And so, right. although it was like really exciting and uh, the record company were really, I guess, pushing it and excited for it, I thought we had better to come. So. Okay. So Jim also asks, it's obvious that you've kept this passion for all these years and you still love performing. What is it about hitting the stage that still keeps it so enjoyable? Uh, well, you know, lots of things that you join a band and you don't know if you're going to be successful, but you know, so the gigs become the fun part. So hanging out with your buddies backstage, meet, meeting fans, um, Especially when the band is playing and they hit something exactly right, that sends a shiver through me. And it also gives me um, some kind of nostalgia. Like, for instance, when we play Space Age and it all comes in right and the atmosphere is right, the sound's right, it takes me right back to when I wrote it, you know, and why I wrote it. So, you know, as you know yourself, we, we tend to play more like robots if you want you know we it's all muscle memory stuff but that allows your mind to wander around the time when you were writing the song and maybe for you it's wow when i first heard this song you know and i wanted to play it and stuff like that but for me it's definitely like going back to the writing stage even though it was 30 odd years ago it still it still sends a little shiver through me when it, everything just hits right. You know, it's, and also say like a golf swing when a golfer knows by the click of the ball exactly that he's hit it just right. So the sweet spot. That kind of feeling, yeah, the sweet spot. And some whole gigs are like that. And then on other gigs, you know, you, you play a song that might feel a little disjointed and then the next one suddenly hits it and you're like, oh, we're off now. This is, yeah. you know, and, and, um, of course, then if the crowd gets into it more and more, the more they give you, the more you want to give back, and it becomes a, a tight relationship, you know. Uh, and when you finish off with wishing and Iran and stuff like that, you know then that you're there to see you, and that's pretty exciting. Yeah. Speaking of nostalgia, uh, Melanie Thompson Singer asks, where have you performed that's been your most favorite or memorable venue? Oh, there's so many, you know, I mean, Madison Square Garden, mm. a couple of times I played there because everybody that's everybody, anybody has played there, you know, and then of course the Hollywood Bowl, I mean, I went and stood where the, every one of the Beatles was, you know, um, and when you do that, it's, it's a completely weird, strange feeling that you kind of go to the stage and go, this is where all the time right here looking out at the same place and it's it's, it's a weird dream it's almost you know it's, it's not real but it, but you're there you know what i mean you can almost some of these places that have history you can feel the history when you go and stand somewhere or you look at it and you feel it history kind of oozing out of the bricks at you you bet so that is a that is a one of the great things, and, and you know, when you're traveling to those places, you go, oh, we're going to play at the Hollywood Bowl, and that, you know, gets you ex excited and vibey on the way, you know. So that's what's great about playing live, is that you go to these places, you see them, you play them, and you become part of the history like your heroes did, you know, like when we played the cavern. Yeah. You know, we stood on the same stage and we 
the same world. And, uh, it's just a magic thing, isn't it? I, I I can't agree more. I, you know, that kind of leads into this next question from Claudia Odenthal. She's in Bonn, Germany. Um, you talk about these live experiences. She's saying online concerts seem to be more prevalent now because of the coronavirus. Do you think that's going to be the next normal? I think it'll be uh, a, a not normal for a while until they, you know, there's a way of either going back to playing real live or um, some some technology comes up that allows it to stream even better than what we're doing. And I, then I think it will become a normal part of what fans do. You know, they will, they will do stuff like this. They'll, they'll film concerts and they will literally um, have a, a streaming gig and maybe the same night they'll be playing somewhere else you know so it's kind of like we could play say the cabin one night and stream that and that can be streaming again the next night while we're playing somewhere else so it, it's another in a way although it's a pain now it's another string to the the bow of artists if you like you know it's another way of of uh, people getting to see you live and it's another way of uh, people that can't get to concerts so much this is going to become more and more so it's not like you're going to be waiting for it to come on TV you'll just be able to dial into it and go hey I want to watch a Fox Seagull I want to watch the Rolling Stones or I want to watch ACDC so you just dial into the, the live show and stream it down a flock of seagulls on demand shows. yeah There'll be live shows and on-demand band shows. That's a great use of new technology. I like that. And maybe while they're streaming, there'll be stuff like this going on during the streaming. So people can talk to the artists uh, just while it's streaming, you know, not particularly while they're playing live. But, sure. But e even that might happen, you know, maybe between songs, they'll have people on screen, but people will say, hey, can you play this one, you know? And... Uh, that will enhance the whole thing as well. Every, I think in the end, everyone will take advantage of whatever technology comes up from this. Being able to embrace that change is really important. I love that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Ed Souza up in Canada, he's asking who your earliest musical inspiration was. Oh, earliest. Um, I don't know. When I was a paper boy in England, when I was about 13, 12 or 13, I always used to have a little transistor radio on my bike. And uh, I used to play the top 40 all the time. So all the top 40 artists in England, uh, you know, from the Beatles, the Stones, and, uh, Bonzo, Dog, Doodah Band, and all these, uh, Scylla Black, anyone that was in the top 40, I was listening to while I was delivering papers. And I think that became my inspiration into music to want to do it. Um, then, when, then when I went to see a couple of bands, I used to sneak in and see bands at the other cabin before the cabin was restored. Then I got into kind of heavy, heavier blues bands and heavy metal bands. And, um, that made me want to play live um, so it was it was kind of like that but obviously when I got into say songwriting it had to be the Beatles because to me they were the best songwriters ever not that everything they've written is absolutely brilliant but sometimes you have to produce a clunker to get a piece of work out of it but sure something in the water there in Liverpool huh <laughs> you know, thinking of you on your paper route, uh, one of Ed's questions also was, if you weren't a musician, what would you be doing? You wouldn't be delivering papers, though. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, but I, I, I never thought that I'd be a musician like I am. Um, but I always thought I should be paid for my ideas. Yeah. So... <laughs> Yes, I don't really want to work. Right. But I just want to have. Um, I, I just. I think I have some really good ideas. And luckily, those ideas have become songs. You know, I'm not say a great 
guitar player or a great keyboard player, but I can I can put that jigsaw together to make a song. And again, luckily, I'm not um, not really that interested in doing other people's songs unless I do them totally different to the way sure. they did them. Uh, I'm only interested in getting my thoughts and my feelings out. And every time I write a song, I think oh, I can actually do better than this. And that forces me on. And then now I look back and go, wow, it's, I've been trying to get better for 35 years. Am I any better yet? And I still don't know. It's a great thing to chase after. I love it. I bet your fans would all say that uh, they appreciate the evolution for sure. Speaking of the evolution, uh, let's see. Jim Jelvig, he did say, have you written any new songs during the lockdown? I have, I have written new songs, um, but not, I don't know, put the, sorry, put the t-shirt back up. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't written songs specifically because it's like the lockdown. I think there's songs that I had ideas and I've just had time to develop them. And I think in a way, that's one of the good things about this happening is that for me, a lot of songs that I was just, oh, there's a great idea, show it away. There's a great idea, show it away. Now I've had time to pull some of those out and work on them and turn them into songs that people will hear in the future. Uh, because I write a lot of songs. Yeah. I just don't finish them. You know, so, lots of ideas. Uh, yeah, uh, I just don't finish them. I, I don't. I, it's too. Uh, and I don't quite how to put it, but one song lands on top of another like this. Sure. So hopefully, this one that I do finish will be the best of that bunch. And then there's another bunch over here doing the same thing. Um, but one thing I did learn to do, but not brilliantly, but quite well, was. Uh, this was I've learned to drum yeah yeah my gig is in jeopardy isn't it yeah you've been playing a lot <laughs> I, I play about an hour a day really yeah it's not uh, it's basically just because um, I want to keep the action going but sure I, now that I've learned now is the time I need to learn you know I need to because I just started playing and it wasn't based on anything except oh that, that's a beat you know, keep doing that so to get just roles and timing but now i need to go how does that work how does this work it, get a little bit more technical but do you put your headphones on uh yeah and and play along to your songs uh, i've played along to lots of songs okay uh, uh anything that like I kind of go, how is that done? Like one of the first ones was Love Me Do. Oh, yeah. You know, and that's a weird little beat, you know? So I was like, oh, yeah, okay, I found that. And a couple of other things I found. Not, nothing. I just went, I've got to learn this, you know, I just played along with stuff. And then played along with some of my own songs so I could just do what I wanted. Sure. Um, but I'm going to need some real lessons. Um, I would love to. You know, the tricky part on Love Me Do, the really the way to get that down, you got to play it left-handed, right? Because Ringo's he's left-handed. He's left-handed, but he played a right-handed kid. And it, it's remarkable how much different he I, played. I uh, listened to an interview he did the other day when he said that the way I drum is I'm a left-handed drummer on a right-handed kit. Right. He said, so everything comes from low to high. Whereas most drummers go high to low. Right. So, and then he says to get my left hand, his right hand to land properly has to do things a weird way, but it fitted with what the Beatles did. No oh man, it really did. Everybody that tries to copy those songs usually gets it wrong, you know? Right, because they it's, go in the right hand way. Yeah, it's so unique. Uh, you know, Yvonne in Colorado, she asks, um, if you had a mentor early on, Mm -hmm. If I had a mentor, uh, you mean like, yeah, did you have another musician that I worked with or somebody that, uh, that, yeah, somebody that maybe took you under their wing and as a wing, so to speak, Siegel and said, uh, uh come here, pod one. Not, not really. You know, I was in, I was in a band called, uh, Tuntrix and the guitar player 
Steve, he was more experienced than me, so he kind of helped me along the way. I wouldn't say he was a mentor, but uh, he was like a calming influence and he, he kind of uh, helped me get past one or two things, but it, it wasn't like I you know, watched him like a hawker and he sure. became a really good friend. And uh, As a musician, uh, it sounds weird, but I, I trusted what he said. Yeah. You know, because uh, he had a good way of delivering it to me and he never, actually never said that was bad, that was wrong. He would basically say something like, you know, that would be great if you changed it to this. You know, not like you're playing the wrong thing. Right. Just like if you could change it to that, it might fit a bit better. You know, very diplomatic. You don't want your little ego. You know, on yeah. You. So you but, just go, oh, I'll try that, and then you go, oh yeah, it's right. And it does it works better. Yeah. You know? So that was that was about the closest I think I came to having a mentor. But mainly, I was uh, I was like, I can do this. You know, uh, I can I can play the bass. I can play keyboards. I can. I can play guitar if I have to, you know. Um, so I didn't really need anybody to lean on very much. So uh, they always seem to get in my way. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're very self-driven yeah. for sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, you've answered this question a million times, but Tammy Bracklin from El Colorado, she also wants to know how did the band name come about? Uh, well, in I guess about 78, 79, I read a book called Jonathan Livingston Seagull, which is only about, I don't know, 18, 20 pages. But it, it totally affected the way I thought about life because if you put yourself in the position of the seagull, this one seagull, he said, look at all these seagulls all fighting for the same piece of bread or scrap of food or whatever. He says, I, I don't want to do that. I've got wings. I'm, I want to fly. I don't want to fight for food. I want to fly. And he looked at eagles and stuff like that. And he said, look at those eagles. They're, they're flying so high. And they look so great. He says, that's what I want to do. So mentally, mentally, I think my thoughts changed from how to get through life to how to fly above life. Um, and that book, I, I read it. Every time I felt a little lost, I read that book again, because it takes an hour. And uh, it, it drove me along my own path, you know? Um, and I think everybody should get that book uh, and read it. And I think a lot of people would inspire. So moving on from that, um, my favorite band was a band called The Stranglers. And in the middle of one of their songs, he just yells out a flock of seagulls because the song is about a shipwreck and uh, we went to see them live and we were in the front row and Hugh Cornwell who was a strangler singer and later on became a friend of mine he just pointed right at me and said a flock of seagulls so after that show we went back to our rehearsal and I scrubbed off the name of the band on the board which was level seven which we knew we couldn't use because level 42 had just released an album. And I wrote A Flock of Seagulls. And everybody looked at it and went, yeah, okay. <laughs> nice. I dub B, A Flock of Seagulls from Hugh Cornwell. I love that. I, I, uh, and it was, it was a, a brilliant moment, you know, to, and then people start to go, what a weird name. And right. as soon as you've got a weird name, no one forgets it. That's right. Weird name, weird haircut, right? Everybody yeah. else, you, uh, you establish your brand early on. Yeah. I, you know, we, we knew from, we knew from uh, watching David Bowie and uh, uh, Alice Cooper and stuff like that. A strong image, you know, was, would get you a long way. So that's probably what we, we were going for. That's great advice for some new bands. Uh, Ed Sousa was asking, what advice would you give you give to a young musician that just starts off today? Um, don't, uh, 
you know, I've, I've been asked this a lot of times, and the, the funny thing is, the answer changes all the right. as well. I would say, um, don't listen too much to people that criticize you because it's not their life and it's not their band. You do what you like your own way. But having said that, there are people that will give you little tidbits of advice that maybe you should take, you know. Um, the only way to really make it, if you ask me, is to be absolutely original. Write your own stuff or do great covers of stuff and believe in yourself. And you don't let people knock you down and say you'll never make it. You know, because as soon as they say you'll never make it, you should be saying to yourself, what do you know? Right. What, how, what the hell do you know about how I'm going to be? Because let's go back to the Beatles. They were the worst band in the world before they came. Right. I love it. Uh, and my mom used to say to me, don't copy anyone. Always be yourself. You know, and she was right. I never copied it. You get hurt. You get hurt sure. by people's criticism. But when you finally do something and people like it, you feel really uplifted and uh, glad you've done your own thing. You know, uh, you haven't had to knuckle down and just copy what other people have done. You can be inspired by it, but don't copy it. So be authentic, original, confident. Great advice. Mike Score, A Flock of Seagulls. My goodness, man, this is so fun. I, I noticed there's a shirt in the background there. That must be the uh, merchandise for this uh, Space Age Love concert that's happening in a minute. Yeah, that's the one. It's just, I think it's just come out. And, uh, you know, I like that. I'm going to get a couple myself. And uh, I think it's a really cool seagullsy kind of shirt with the spaceship you know i, w I was always into sci-fi and space stuff so any shirt the supply of seagulls with the flying saucer is, is on the right track. So that's it that. well i think people could probably get that if they log on right now and go to www.abductedbythe80s.com and then stay tuned because right from the outer space to your sofa a flock of seagulls and spoons are coming at you live. Thanks again, Mike Score. We appreciate it. Have a great evening, everybody. Have a great time. Let's go rock and roll, Mike. Let's hit the stage. Let's do it. All right. <laughs>